Welcome to Hot Takes, the Hotwire podcast. Hotwire is a global tech communications consultancy, and I'm Amber Roberts, a senior associate of media strategy here at Hotwire, and your host for this episode. This is the fourth in a series of episodes focused on media strategy topics, featuring reporters and writers from within the industry, offering key advice and valuable takeaways on a variety of topics. Today, you are listening to A Day in the Life of a Broadcast Journalist, and I'm talking to Janine Donaldson, a professional TV broadcaster. Janine has more than a decade of experience in the field. She's worked at various news stations, such as the national outlet Black News Channel, which recently ceased operations, and for local news outlets, such as WJZY-TV in Charlotte, North Carolina, and WTVM in Columbus, Georgia. Before we dive in, let me give you a brief overview of what Janine and I are going to talk about. We have four main topics. The first, how broadcast journalists identify stories. The second, what's happening behind the scenes. The third, she's going to share insights on the various types of on-air journalists. And fourth, we will wrap up with her perspective on advocacy and community journalism, what some PR specialists refer to as catered or affinity pups. Janine, kicking it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. How are you? Doing well. So starting off with our first topic, how do journalists identify stories? Janine, when it comes to your news gathering techniques, where and how do you and other broadcast journalists find your stories? Well, we find our stories in a variety of places. My favorite way to find stories is by talking to people in the community, because that's the way you find out what people really, you know, what's really bothering them, what's you know, really meaningful to the people, your viewers. Um, Other ways to identify stories are by, um, you know, following different organizations on their Twitter feeds and different uh, various social media outlets, also by getting press releases uh, to your inbox and by making what we call in the industry context. So you may have context in government, uh, local, federal, state, Um, You'll have contacts with certain community organizations. You may have contacts within uh, different law enforcement um, agencies, different companies, just contacts or people that you know and communicate with um, often just to kind of find out what's going on. So there are a variety of ways to um, find stories. Also, we do what everybody else does. When we're online and we see what everybody else is talking about, we become interested just like the viewing public. Um, And also by reading a lot of publications, newspapers, magazines, just the same way that everyone else in Just News, we do too, but we take that information and we try to look beyond or beneath what's been written to say, okay, this is the issue that they pose, but now it's my job to find out why the issue exists. So we have to maybe see the same things as everyone else, but view it differently. And Janine, it's really about building those relationships and building human connections with the public, with sources. It's really about people at the end of the day. That's the root of all of your stories. Absolutely. The people are why we come to work every day. You know, what is basically news is celebrating people's triumphs, keeping people in power, holding them to account, um, and also telling the stories of other people who may be going through the best and or worst days of their lives. So what are their tragedies? What are their triumphs? And um, doing that every day. But people are very much at the root of everything we do. Janine, wanted to draw your attention to a recent muckrack survey that indicated Twitter was considered the most useful social media platform for journalists. Would you agree or say you find use in Twitter for keeping up with current news events or finding story ideas? I love Twitter. Everybody loves Twitter. In fact, my first job in news um, was on the assignment desk in Philadelphia, and my boss told us, if you're not on Facebook and Twitter, Uh, Twitter was newer at the time. But if you're not on Facebook and Twitter, you're not doing your job. And we were expected to be logged in all day because Twitter is real time. So, you know, other outlets, other social medias, newspapers, newscasts, everything has to wait for a time to be posted or for you to view it. Maybe you have to wait till the six o'clock news to see what happened at three o'clock this afternoon. Or for Facebook, maybe people are posting what happened and then you know doing a completely different post as things develop. 
in Twitter, everything is real time and it's very quick. So it is a tremendous um, tool for people in journalism um, to be able to find out, okay, you know, what's going on. For instance, Will Smith smacked Chris Rock and immediately I was on Twitter to see what everybody was talking about. You know, who was posting it, who was talking about it. I was talking about it because it's an immediate place and it's a, a community where you know everyone's going to be on it. So it's no delay on Twitter, which makes it so valuable. So yes, I would say that Twitter is a huge tool um, and definitely one of my favorite um, resources. And what elements would you say are important for a good broadcast story as we're talking about news gathering techniques and advice for people who may be interested in pitching a broadcast story? So say if a PR specialist or someone who works for a business wants to have a story air on a broadcast platform, specifically television, what elements should they have? First and foremost, impact definitely is the number one thing that any news reporter, any news outlet, um, and your bosses are going to want to find out. Yes, this may be great, but who is it impacting? How many people is this impacting? What demographic is this impacting? Um, and so impact is definitely number one. I would think when you're putting together a story, you definitely want to answer the who, what, when, where, why, hows. Um, that's just basic journalism. You want to get the questions answered. You want to talk to people who not only have the information, maybe say if there's a problem or for an instance, maybe we're talking about the housing market, which right now is crazy all over the country. Well, you want to talk to people who are um, well-versed in mortgages and real estate and all of that, you want to talk to the experts because you need that information from them. But you also need to talk to people who are going through it, everyday people who you can connect with. It's the connection, the emotion of it um, that really draws in viewers, readers um, to really connect with the story and, you know, to keep coming back. So you definitely need to have those elements. And then obviously for broadcast, we need the visuals. What video can you add to it? Um, but again, impact, information, you want to make sure that you have, a, you know, somebody who really knows what they're talking about in there. And then also somebody who has been impacted because that's relatable for the viewer. Now, moving on to our second topic, which is behind the scenes insights. Janine, can you walk us through at a high level overview what a day in the life of a broadcast journalist looks like? Now, I understand no day is the same, but what are some of those daily standards in a newsroom for on-air talent like yourself? Um, no matter if you are in a local newsroom in Texas or if you are covering statewide politics in New Jersey or if you are called covering national news um, based out of Charlotte, which all things I've done, your day basically has the same flow to it. So your day always typically begins with um, an editorial meeting. And that's where it's a meeting of the minds with managers, um, reporters, oftentimes photographers, definitely producers. Um, it's a, you know, a big round table conversation about what are the stories for today? Everyone brings ideas to the uh, to the table. Typically, I would say reporters bring about three story ideas a day. Um, and we all pitch our stories and the managers decide what's important for coverage that day. Um, what are these day of stories? It may be, you know, we want to have there's something going on crime wise. OK, we definitely have to cover that because it's a public safety issue. Um, there's something going on. Maybe there's an update with COVID. Um, there's a happy story because we don't want to depress people while they're watching. So we may have that. We may have an investigative story. So they try to have a variety of content. And that's all discussed at that table. Some people have difference of opinions. Some may say, I don't think this story is important while other people are fighting for it. But that's really how the day kicks off in a newsroom. It always starts with that meeting. Whether you're in the morning shift or the evening, we all come in and we start our day with this meeting. Then from there, you get your assignment and you start making calls. You're calling your contacts. You're reaching out to people, emails, phone calls. Um, you know, you're just trying to gather information. You're doing a lot of research. 
Um, you may be putting in requests for information. Um, and so now the news gathering process begins. And so now you're researching the topic, you're reaching out to people who can speak to it. Um, usually once you get an idea of who you may speak to or you know whatever, you go out. Um, and for us in broadcast, we'll go out and start getting video. So maybe we're talking about um, COVID affecting hospitals. Well, now we're going to go to the hospital. We're going to get video. We may be getting video of a full parking lot, video of the building, maybe video of healthcare workers coming and going. Um, you know, whatever the story is about, you try to tailor the video to that story. So now you're shooting your video, you're shooting your interviews. Um, and then once all of that news gathering process is completed, you have your sound, you have your pictures, you have your information. Now you start to pull all of that together and write your story. Um, and so you put your story together, you match your story with the video that you have. Um, sometimes in news, we do that with a partner. We'll have a photographer. Um, it's becoming more common in this industry for to do what we call multimedia journalists or MMJs, which do all of the news gathering process themselves from shooting, writing, editing, reporting, even covering their own live shots. Um, but if you have a photographer, they work with you on that process. If not, you're doing it yourself. Um, and I've done both. Much more prefer being a reporter and not having to do everything. But which, uh, which Janine uh, is actually our next topic that you're seamlessly transitioning into, which are broadcast <laughs> titles. So you're talking about it now, but can we go through one by one the difference between an MMJ, a reporter, and a correspondent? Because those roles and responsibilities for these on air journalists based on those titles, it really differs. And you're weighing in on that right now. Yeah. So again, a multimedia journalist, an MMJ is a multimedia journalist. And again, that's somebody who wears all the hats. At one point, they were called one man bands. But one woman are, bands, I'm gonna toss that in there right quick because me and you have both done that. Yes, absolutely. And uh, so MMJs again, they shoot, they write, they edit, they'll go live by themselves, they do the whole process of news gathering and reporting, um, broadcasting it, they do the process themselves. Sometimes you can even be an MMJ who gets all the news, edits, shoots it, edits it. And then maybe you'll have a photographer that will do your live shot with you, but they're still considered MMGs because they're also shooting and editing and news gathering. Reporters, same thing. However, they work with a photographer so they don't shoot their own video and they don't edit it. So a reporter still does the news gathering. They still conduct interviews. They still um, present the news um, on a broadcast. They're writing, they're doing all of that. But again, they have a partner that they're working with who shoots and edits. Um, <clears throat> and a correspondent, I have been a statewide correspondent and a national correspondent. And to me, I guess the, the difference is really title because reporter and correspondent are very much the same job. The only difference I think I may add is the amount of travel that you do. As a correspondent, you're often flown out to different locations or traveling to different locations and going to where the news is outside of your local news market. So in New Jersey, I was a statewide correspondent. So I may be in North Jersey. I may cover South Jersey. I may cover the shore towns up and down the coastline. I was not um, beholden to one particular area, uh, which we call DMAs or designated market areas. Um, and as a national correspondent, I was sent to where the stories were around the country. So whether it be Illinois or Georgia, Florida, um, you know, wherever the news is, that's where I was being sent. So I would think the only real difference with the correspondent title from reporter is the amount of travel that you do, in my opinion. 
Great insight there, Janine. And for our last topic, wanted to discuss your perspective on advocacy and community journalism. In the PR world, we may refer to these as catered or affinity pubs, which are outlets that cater to a specific demographic or population. As previously stated, Janine worked for Black News Channel, a national outlet that ceased broadcast operations and filed for bankruptcy earlier this year, causing most of its employees to be laid off, including Janine. I'd like to note that recently there's been talks about the outlet searching for a new buyer to potentially resume operations. Now, two things I want to dive into here, Janine. First, can you weigh in on the role of affinity pubs like Black News Channel? Sure. So Black News Channel was a first of its kind very needed news organization. And I can tell you, you know, you talked a bit about um, the unfortunate demise of Black News Channel. And it was very sad to see that go and also my job with it, mostly because it was something that we were also very passionate about because it had not been done before and it was so needed. But what Black News Channel did was focused on telling stories of the Black and Brown communities and the impacts that the same things that everyone covers every day, be it COVID, supply chain disruptions, um, inflation, all of the things that every news outlet discusses every day. But what is the specific impact on Black and Brown people? And what we found was that anytime we were covering these stories, there was more often than not, and I would even venture to say always, a disproportionate impact on people of color. And so it was very necessary for us to do these things because it had not been done before. In most local news outlets, yes, they may talk to um, black and brown folks within the community, but there is no specific focus on that. And it's necessary, be it if you're black or brown, whether you're white, whether you're Asian, um, Indian, whatever your nationality is um, or ethnicity, it's important to have these um, focuses on how these communities are impacted because there is no one size fits all solution to the, the problems. And so what, you, you know, again, we talked about some hot things that have been going on within the country, some issues that the country has faced within the last year from COVID to inflation to all of these different things, but the, and particularly the housing market. And again, it's the impact and the way that they impact certain communities that makes finding a solution uh, in the information that you're giving people it has to be tailored to that particular community. And I'll give you an example. The mortgage issue that's going on right now, or not mortgage, but the housing issue that's going on, it specifically impacts Black folks differently because Black folks have to also deal with historical redlining. They are denied more often than not from mortgage loans. Even with the refinancing boom of 2020, more Black applicants were denied a mortgage refinancing loan than any other group of people. And so when you are giving people, um, viewers, information as to, okay, maybe you need to have your credit score, you need to have this, you need to have that. Well, there are many Black folks who had all of those things, but were still denied or still could not get into the housing market. And for us particularly, um, home ownership is the key to building wealth in our community. And so it was a big issue for us to be left out or left behind in this boom that was happening because we were then missing out on the wealth that came with it. So when you're talking about um, different topics, there's again, not a one size fits all solution for different people who may experience different uh, issues tackling that same thing. So with Black News Channel, it was a tremendous resource for our viewers. It was a breath of fresh air to feel seen, um, to feel that you were not being ignored, to feel recognized, and to offer a different perspective as well, because there are a lot of things that I know this from, you know, folks that I know who watched Black News Channel, that 
they didn't realize, okay, well, this is the, we've heard about this issue, but we didn't hear about the specific impact on us. And so they were becoming more educated about it. And so it was extremely vital. Um, it was an extremely vital outlet. And I was sad to see it go. Many of the people who worked at BNC Janine, both on air and behind the scenes, were people of color and seasoned journalists who, like you, are now searching for jobs. What's your journey to finding your next job been like? It's been difficult. And I would say it has been because as a national correspondent, I guess you have reached a certain level of your career where you want to do something similar to that and also bring in similar money, if we're being honest. And the, the higher you go in this industry, the smaller your options become. And so there are not many positions open right now for people on air, um, particularly on the East Coast. When you look at the East Coast, you have um, coming from maybe a national correspondent, you really have New York, Philly, maybe Baltimore, DC and Atlanta. And that, you know, people are focusing on. There are other stations in Georgia as well. But for people like myself, several of us come from the Northeast. So if you want to stay anywhere closer to home, those are your options. And there are not, there, it's so competitive to get into those markets that you are, um, you're in a competitive arena with a lot of people. People from across the country want to get into those markets. Not only that, but you're also entering this arena with your coworkers, your former coworkers from Black News Channel, who too are now looking for jobs and we're all vying for the same few positions that exist. And so fortunately, um, you know, many companies have been sympathetic to our situation and have reached out and said, you know, maybe how can we help you? Let's see if what you wanna do aligns with what we have available. Um, and also, you know, there's some friends who have uh, reached out with freelancing opportunities to help get the bills paid in the meantime um, and keep your skills sharp. But it is very tough because you are grieving the loss of a job and something that you really truly believed in and were very passionate about. So it does very much feel like a loss. And you're struggling to understand it because it was so abrupt. And you're grappling with that while also looking for a job, while also trying to survive. And so there's a lot to there's a lot to sift through in the job search. So some of it is not just about finding a job, you know, nailing that down, doing the interview. A lot of it is emotional. And um, and as journalists, I think many of us tie a big piece of our identity to what we do. In some other areas, people will say, well, that's my job. And in news, it's more like, this is my life. And so, um, you know, it's tough, but it's the news business and it's not easy. And once you've been in it for a while, you kind of understand that it's not for the faint of heart. And if you can't hack it, get out. If you get out and you miss it, come back, you know, um, or, you know, some people burn out. Some people just need a break. Um, it just happens. It's the news business. It's fickle. It's changing. And um, you have to love it to do it. Well, Janine, we are wishing you best in your future career endeavors. And we want to say thank you for joining us today. And thanks to those of you listening. If you would like to hear more from Janine, you can follow her on Twitter at Janine Donaldson. And also, if you have more questions or would like information about Hotwire, please visit us at hotwireglobal.com. We'll have new episodes soon. So please sign up on our website and we'll let you know when they're available. Signing off, I'm Amber Roberts with Hotwire's Hot Takes.